This is CNN Breaking News. We have breaking news tonight. It is a landmark in the Russian investigation. Let's go right to CNN's Evan Perez and Pamela Brown. Pam, what have you learned? Uh, Anderson, we've learned that a federal grand jury in Washington, D.C. on Friday approved the first charges in the investigation led by special counsel Robert Mueller. This is according to sources briefed on the matter. Uh, the charges are still sealed under orders from a federal judge at this hours. And Anderson, we're told that plans were prepared Friday for anyone charged to be taken into custody, possibly as soon as Monday, uh, these sources said. It's unclear exactly what these charges are against the indictment. The indictment is under seal. A spokesman for the special counsel's office declined to comment on this story. And as you know, Anderson, Mueller was appointed in May uh, to lead the investigation into Russian meddling uh, in the 2016 U.S. elections. Um, and he was given broad authority under the mandate given to him by Rod Rosenstein. So this is a significant development in the investigation. Uh, top lawyers who are helping to lead the Mueller firm, um, the, the probe, we should say, including a veteran prosecutor, Andrew Wiseman were seen today entering the courtroom at the D.C. federal court uh, where the grand jury meets to hear testimony in the Russia investigation and, and reporters present uh, saw a flurry of activity at the grand jury room but officials made no announcements but we are learning today Anderson uh, that the grand jury approved the first charges in the Mueller investigation. So just to be clear Pim, we don't know what the charges are at this point and we don't know who has been charged. Uh, that's correct. We have ideas of um, who has been charged, but we are not naming those people. We, we don't believe that they have actually been notified yet. Typically what happens is the grand jury will um, approve an indictment. It'll stay under seal, and then they will go through a certain process that takes a few days or a couple of days to get the arrest warrant and so forth before perhaps the attorney is called asking for that person, for the attorney to, turn, to have their clients turn themselves in. Uh, so we believe that may be at play because we are told, again, um, as early as Monday, possibly Monday or perhaps beyond, that is when we may see um, some law enforcement activity related to these indictments under C.L. Anderson. Evan, do we, can you say or do we know if it's more than one person? Well, uh, Anderson, we believe it's uh, more than one person, but again, uh, the, they have not been notified, and that's one of the things we were trying to do today. We were working on this story uh, for several hours as we were trying to contact some of the lawyers of the people involved. Some of them did not get back to us, uh, so we'll be continuing to work on that uh, over the weekend. Okay. But, you know, it is something that, uh, obviously, because it's under seal, it makes it, it's actually one of the most more difficult parts of this story to cover. So, Evan, to bring charges like this, who would have to approve them? Well, Rod Rosenstein is the uh, attorney general here who's handling this, uh, who's overseeing this investigation. He's the deputy attorney general, but for this case, because the uh, attorney general, Jeff Sessions, is recused, he is acting as the attorney general. And so he oversees this, and he has the right to, 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 to review the charges, and if he thinks that they're not appropriate, he can uh, tell Robert Mueller that he doesn't approve them. He can reject them. So uh, at this stage, uh, Anderson, we don't know exactly what interaction there was, but we do believe that given the regulations that govern uh, what Mueller is doing, that he would have had to give uh, Rod Rosenstein notice about this uh, and, and, and at least, you know, told him what he was preparing to do and given Rosenstein uh, the, the chance to say you can't do this if he believed it was not appropriate. Would that information be given to the White House as well or be given to Attorney General Jeff Sessions since he had recused himself? No, not under this circumstance. Under this circumstance, it would be something that uh, that Rosenstein, who is, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, the attorney general for this case, he is the one, the ultimate authority uh, to, to, to oversee this. And it would not, under these circumstances, uh, be notified to the White House, simply because, Anderson, this is a case in, that, that involves so many people at the White House, of course, including the president. So, Pam, how significant, I mean, uh, let's put this in perspective. Uh, and again, we don't know uh, what the charges are or uh, who has been charged or, or haven't confirmed it or we're not saying it. Um, how significant a development is this in, in the Russian investigation? It's a landmark development. I mean, this is what, in a sense, we've been waiting to see if this will happen, if Robert Mueller's team will bring any indict indictments related to uh, the Russia probe. This is an investigation that's been going on for well over a year. It started in the 2016 campaign. The FBI opened it. And then, as you know, Robert Mueller took over in May. And um, it had groups of investigators looking at possible collusion, uh, looking at Paul Manafort, the former campaign chairman, um, 
Flynn, Michael Flynn, the former national security advisor, and also uh, looking at obstruction of justice uh, with the president's firing of James Comey and the circumstances surrounding that. And so um, this is this is certainly a big significant step um, and an acceleration, an indication that the investigation has accelerated to a point where they believe they have the case. It's probable cause. You have to, to show probable cause when you go before a grand jury. So they believe they have enough to at least show probable cause um, for at least one person who has been under investigation in this probe. And we should also mention that uh, it will be interesting to see what the charges are, because if they have nothing to do with the campaign or Russia, you can expect uh, Mueller's shop to draw a lot of heat, especially from the White House. You heard the president say that this is a waste of taxpayer dollars. And so if this has nothing to do with that, um, that will be really, really interesting to see. But Mueller has broad authority under the regulations to, to investigate anything that may arise from the Russia probe, Anderson. Evan, do you have a sense of uh, what the process for this is? You said that, you know, arrests uh, could be made uh, Monday or, or Tuesday or, or in that time frame. Right. Uh, but in terms of what, what the charges are, is that announced at some point? Does the Department of Justice announce who who uh, is going to be arrested or right. only well, after that, they've they, been arrested? Well, understanding our understanding, uh, Anderson, is that they, that is the plan, is that once these people have been arrested, uh, then the special counsel would make a public announcement about what these charges are and the people who are affected. Again, uh, part of the, the issue here is making sure you know where these people are, uh, making sure that you contact the lawyers. I mean, in this case, they would probably call the lawyers perhaps on Sunday or Monday and tell them you have until a certain hour to have your client turn themselves in. And obviously, if they don't do that, then uh, the, uh, the U.S. Marshals and the FBI would try to figure out how to put them, bring, bring them under arrest. And, and then the procedure would be then to bring them to court here in, the, uh, in D.C., in Washington, uh, and then uh, take them to, to, to get the, the charges read to them for the first time in, in federal court. And I just want to add real quick to, to what uh, Pamela was just saying. I mean, one of the things, and look, this is not, I don't think this is affecting how Robert Mueller is handling this case, but you've got to think, right, if you're you're running an investigation like this and you're starting to hear uh, Republicans are now starting to say that it's the time is, is ticking away and that it's time for to, to try to end this uh, and you hear the president now sending out uh, tweets about about the, the, the costliness of this investigation look they do have to do something to show what it is they're coming up with and I think what that, that's partly what what's happening here is that I think they believe that they have enough evidence uh, to be able to bring charges against at least a couple of individuals uh, or at least uh, at least one individual here in this case uh, and that's what's happening here Anderson uh, Evan Perez Pamela Brown appreciate it. I know you're continuing to work your sources I want to bring in the panel Carl Burns Michael Zeldin, John Dean, and uh, Jeff Tubin. Um, Michael, uh, let's put this into perspective for, for us. What does this mean for the Mueller investigation? Well, what it means is that he's indicted somebody. We don't know whether it's to the core charge of collusion or whether to the collateral charge of money laundering or tax evasion. What we can surmise from Pamela's reporting, if it was Andrew Weissman who was at the courthouse who was returning the indictment, Weissman has been on the Manafort case and that it therefore might be logical to conclude that it is right. Manafort. Manafort has been under scrutiny for both collusion and also for his real estate dealings and for tax and money laundering investigation. So you could have an investigation of Manafort separate from the collusion, but which implicates his dealings with the monies that he earned in Ukraine and elsewhere overseas. Jeff Tubin, what's your take on this from a legal standpoint? Well, it's, it's a peculiar situation because um, indictments are rarely announced without knowing who the defendant is or what the charges are. But um, it, it is certainly a major landmark in the course of this investigation. The other point to make is that um, two, two points. One, um, in white-collar investigations, usually the first indictments are against individuals that you hope will plead guilty and cooperate against others. You don't indict the big fish first. You indict smaller fishes in hope of getting the big fish. In the other point to make is that um, these white-collar cases take a long time, and it's very unlikely uh, that this case would even get to trial for six months to a year. So if anybody thinks the Mueller investigation is going to be wrapping up um, in, in the next couple of months, this decision today 
uh, pretty much guarantees that the Mueller office will be up and running um, well into uh, 2018, if not through the whole year and beyond. M- Michael, do you back up what, what Jeff is saying, that, that you go after the smaller fish first in the hopes that they will uh, essentially flip or, or succumb to pressure? Well, typically that's the case, but it's not necessary that this is a typical case. If you look back at Whitewater, for example, they indicted several people for bank fraud None of them were really small fish. None of them really had anything to say about the president's corruption. But they were significant financial transactions that were alleged and were indicted and were proved, and these guys went to jail. So it could well be that a Manafort or a Flynn or somebody who has dealings on the outside of the collusion gets indicted for that activity. It's been five months. Weissman, if it's his case, is a fast-moving prosecutor. And it well then could be, as Jeffrey says, that if it is one of those guys and they are found guilty or they plead guilty, that then they have something more to sell with respect to the collusion inquiry. Hmm. Because you have to remember it's collusion and then other things that may arise out of the investigation. This may be the arise out part, which leads back into the collusion if there's a story to tell there. Carl, stunning night. Well, Jeffrey Tubin's got it exactly right. That uh, I've talked to some of the lawyers who knew this was coming. Uh, they believe that the intent is to get one or more of these people to cooperate and turn over some more facts about what the prosecutors think may be a conspiracy. Uh, whether or not these charges go directly to, quote, collusion. And one of the lawyers, cor- correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think collusion in itself is a crime. I think it would have to be part of a conspiracy. But this all goes really to a larger question of possible disloyalty to the United States by helping a foreign power undermine our elections. So, so there's all kinds of larger ethical, moral, and legal questions raised. And now what we're trying to see, uh, Mueller is trying to do, is to move this investigation to determine what happened in terms of whether there was a conspiracy to undermine our democratic system. Well, uh, you know, Anderson, in the United States, criminal indictments are usually public things. We keep our, pub, our criminal proceedings public in the United States. When you see a sealed indictment like this, it almost always happens for one reason. There's a fear that the defendant is going to flee the jurisdiction. Occasionally, in big organized crime type cases, you might be worried about a threat to a witness whose name is revealed in the indictment. But I don't think we're going to see that in this case. So this suggests whoever they're indicting, they're afraid he's going to flee. Laura Coates, how do you see this? Well, you know, the irony here is quite thick, that the focus of the day has been on the dossier as if that was the only basis for Robert Mueller's collusion investigation, which, of course, has many, many arms, including Michael Flynn, including Paul Manafort, including Jared Kushner's security forums, including Roger Stone boasting of WikiLeaks. The list goes on and on about all the people who are potentially implicated by this indictment. And so it's a reminder that Robert Mueller is running quite the tight ship that you have weeks after or months after different investigations are concluded by his team that you're hearing information, even leading up to today where you've got this sealed indictment. What it's indicating to me is, one, that they are trying to in- encourage cooperation, but also that their investigation has taken on many different incantations, and one of them being the fact that this may be a tangentially related um, notion to the overall collusion claim, but that is exactly the precise reason why Robert Mueller has the directive he does. Whatever can come from the initial con- collusion investigation, he is entitled to work with. And this may be an indication that he's not trying to show his hand because he doesn't want people to be able to either conceal evidence, destroy evidence. It may be the reason that he was able to do a surprise, certain, um, no, knock announce, no knock and announce warrant on Paul Manafort's home. There is an urgency that Robert Mueller is seeing, and it may be a flight risk. It may also be because there are some missing pieces that he's hoping to encourage to come together in this case. Uh, for, for viewers who are just joining us, the first charges filed in the Mueller investigation. The story just breaking uh, just a short time ago. Uh, We don't know exactly who uh, those charges have been filed against or the nature of those charges. We expect to to hear that, obviously, in the coming days. Arrests could be made as as early as Monday. Uh, Lawyers would be notified on Sunday, according to our reporters, or over the weekend at some point. David Gergen, I mean, from what we know at this point, how serious is this for the Trump administration? (laughs) Well, it's, it certainly looks like the dam is starting to break now, Anderson, after a long while. 
I think we're going to be in suspense over the next couple of days until we know exactly what the charges are. If the charges relate to con collusion or conspiracy uh, against the United States, as uh, you know, Carl just pointed out, or if they're about money laundering, that's going to send a shudder through the White House. Uh, because what that would suggest is two things. First of all, the president has been wrong that there's nothing to this. There actually, there's probable cause to believe in, in, in Mueller's mind uh, that, in fact, criminal crimes were committed uh, in, in that zone. That, and there's a much better chance of flipping somebody if, 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 that's, the er if that's the area that the, where, the, where their evidence has taken them. On the other hand, if it's, say it's a Manafort and he's indicted for some sort of illegal money transaction he had personally some one time ago, and that, that, that doesn't, you know, that suggests they, they've got very little on the question of collusion and on money laundering. So I think a lot depends on what the charges are as an addition to it. If it's, if it's money laundering or, or if it's collusion, I think that uh, Jeffrey and Carl are absolutely right. There's going to be a big effort to flip whoever it is who's indicted. But, but uh, Jeff Tubin, I mean, if it is, uh, you know, some past crime, financial crime from years ago, is it, you know, David's saying, you know, certainly the White House will say, well, look, that's nothing about collusion. This is, uh, this is going, reaching back in history years. Uh, is it possible those kind of charges are brought to your point in order to get them to flip uh, and a kind of a smaller fish charge them with something from the past to get them to flip on what they may, or may know? Right. People flip because they know they're going to be convicted and looking at serious jail time. It doesn't necessarily mean they have to flip on precisely the issue that they will testify against higher up. I mean, I, I, I know we are in a position here of speculating, and that's not, that, that's not ideal. But, you know, I, I think the, the precise nature of the charges against whoever this is, one or more persons, doesn't necessarily tell you about the future investigation, the future course of the investigation. All it means is that the, the Mueller team has found probable cause against somebody or some persons, and um, they are going to try to win that case or get a guilty plea and, and a conviction or, 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 and, and testimony. I, I, I think the precise nature of the charges will tell you something about the direction of the investigation, but it won't necessarily tell you everything that Mueller has learned at this point. There's one other aspect of this, and, and that is that it's very possible, and it's been suggested to me by some of the lawyers involved, that Mueller wants to send a signal to other prospective defendants. If this person who has been indicted or persons are facing 20 to 40 to 50 years for whatever these crimes are related to collusion or not, there are others who may be subject to similar charges who have further knowledge about dealings with Russia. And so it may be aimed at these prospective indictees uh, as well, not simply this person or persons who they want to flip. So it's, there are a lot of intentions that the special counsel uh, is trying to convey here, I suspect. John Dean, we haven't, heard, we haven't heard from you. Well, I, well, it's not the intent of the special prosecutor here to tease. This is one of the largest independent special prosecutor teases of all time. Uh, I think the consensus that is emerging from the conversation is that this is an effort to flip somebody. Uh, this certainly seems to be the way to do it. Uh, we're left speculating right now, and we'll get a lot more uh, information when we know the nature of the charges. It'll tell us both the status and direction of uh, the Mueller investigation. It'll tell us what the White House jeopardy may or may not be. Uh, but it's awfully early still, and Mueller has held his cards very close. So. Uh, this is a very interesting move. Michael, Pam, Pam Brown talked about this. Uh, I'm sorry, Laura, you, you were wanting to say something. I was going to say to, thank you. To be clear, the idea that the special counsel is simply holding one card to um, hedge his way into a prosecution is not the issue here. It's not what he's ultimately trying to do. When you charge someone with an, an, and you have an indictment, your intention is possibly to convict, not simply to flip. That may be an aspiration of the, or a, you know, a, a secondary issue there, but it's not the ultimate goal. But it's very important to consider that even though this is, uh, it is, is 
speculation aspect of it. One charge today in a separate case is not foreclose or preclude the person who is indicted right now from being charged in other future cases involving other collusion related things or perhaps money laundering. So we're not talking about a closed universe of prosecutions right now. So we have to be very cautious about speculating that this would be the end for that particular person. They may be included in many others. Michael, if, from your experience uh, and for our viewers who have just been joining us who didn't hear Pam and, and Evan, Evan's uh, reporting on sort of the timeline of what the next several days holds, can you give a sense of when are lawyers notified that their clients, uh, you know, have been indicted? Are the lawyers, I assume the lawyers are told the charges directly at that point? And, yeah. and when are arrests, how are arrests actually carried out? Well, typically the arrests should be voluntary surrender in a case like this, in, unless, as Jeffrey said, there's a risk of flight and then they'll be arrested and handcuffed. Some prosecutors used to like to handcuff and arrest people in public. They call them perp walks where they display them. Rudy Giuliani did that a lot. I, I personally don't, don't like that. Um, I think that if a person is not a flight risk, they should voluntarily turn themselves in. But in this case, they will notify counsel that their client has been indicted, and uh, that will be over the weekend. They will tell the client, uh, the, the lawyer, what they expect of their client, whether it's a, to be arrested or, or to be turned in. The indictments will be unsealed so that the lawyers have a clear knowledge of what their client is being charged with. Then the person will be brought to court and they'll be presented to the char charges um, and they'll have to enter a plea in the future after that and then the case goes forward. And, and Michael, we know obviously grand jury, uh, this is the result of, of a grand jury. Um, can you just explain how that process works for those who you know, aren't familiar with, with the grand jury system? Uh, you know, how long, we know the grand jury, I think there's two grand juries going on. H how exactly does the grand jury bring about charges? Well, the grand jury is made up of a group of citizens who are brought in generally for about an 18 month period. The prosecutor only is the person that presents evidence to the grand jury. They meet in the courthouse um, and they often meet like once or twice a week. Evidence is put forth by the prosecutor uh, as they build the blocks of the case. And then once the prosecutor has enough information that they think is sufficient to allow the grand jury to indict, they present a grand jury um, indictment, a draft indictment, and they say, we ask you to return charges um, as set forth here. And the grand jury then votes yay or nay. And if they vote yay, uh, the indictment is, is uh, perfected, if you will, and the charges are um, joined. Uh, you know, and I was going to say also, the, uh, the thing you have to remember with the information that we have here now is it's possible, yes, that pressure is being used through these indictments to flip uh, lower level people in the case. But it's also quite possible that on Monday or Tuesday of next week, uh, someone like Manafort or somebody else who's been publicly identified in this case will voluntarily surrender uh, with his lawyer and that a deal may already have been made and that the indictment is simply going to be handled uh, in a, a lenient way in exchange for <coughs> testimony going down the road. So there are enormous number of possibilities here. We only know that a grand jury has found probable cause that a crime has been committed and uh, sufficient to warrant an indictment and that somebody's going to be brought in. We really, well, we're really doing a lot of speculation, I think. Uh, but Jeff Tubin, uh, in front of a grand jury, there is no def the, the, there's no defense, correct? It's just the prosecutor. Right. It doesn't even look like a courtroom. A, a, a grand jury room tends to look like a classroom where um, there is a witness stand, but the prosecutor runs the show and the jurors sit classroom style and are, are allowed to ask questions often, sometimes directly, sometimes through the prosecutor. It is something that is very much controlled by the prosecution. There is no uh, defense attorney. The witnesses are not allowed to have a defense attorney in the room. Um, and a grand jury uh, does not have to be unanimous to issue an indictment the way a jury has to be unanimous to um, reach a conviction. They need only to have um, uh, a majority. Um, the, so, so an indictment is not you know, tantamount to conviction. I think people should be very much aware of that. Just because someone's indicted doesn't mean they're indicted, they're guilty of anything. But obviously, it is not a step that responsible responsible prosecutors take unless they feel like the case ultimately will end in a conviction. 
and um, certainly the very experienced group that Robert Mueller has, has surrounded him with uh, is well aware of that, and they would not be bringing this case unless they thought they could put it in front of a trial jury. Lord Coates, would the attorney or attorneys for one person or two people, however many have been indicted, would they, I know they haven't been notified, but would they have a sense that this was going to be happening? And would they, they, have, would they have a sense of the information that had been presented to the grand jury since they're not in, in the grand jury room? Only if they, the people who were actually witnesses before the grand jury somehow indicated or told them they were. The whole, whole premise of a grand jury is to operate in secret, which of course is very different than what happens in a trial where you don't want the notion that people are able to be convicted behind closed doors and not in the public eye. You want the protections of a judge who's not present in a grand jury scenario. So if the witnesses themselves somehow were able to disclose or chose to disclose information, then they would have an inkling into whether or not their client was going to be indicted or what information they would have. But the whole premise is to operate in secrecy in order to have the subpoena power be most effective. Because the most important notion or, or role of a grand jury is to have subpoena power over documents, over people, to be able to come in and testify. So without that secrecy, you do not have the ability to have as much access to everyone else. So it would not be in the interest of the prosecuting team to have it disclosed, but a witness is able to disclose information if they choose. Uh, you know, I, I, do think that, um, I do think that you, yep. you will, uh, the attorneys will see this coming because when you're under uh, investigation, subpoenas are issued for your bank records and it's your friends who are being subpoenaed to the grand jury and prosecutors may even have told you, uh, the attorney, that your client is a target in the investigation. So I think most certainly whoever is the attorney for the client in this case saw the indictment coming. Michael, I think was that you saying you want to say something? I, I was just going to add what Paul added, which was that yeah. normally you'll get a target letter. If you're the target of a grand jury, meaning you have a likelihood of being indicted, you get that notification. And I don't think that anyone who has received a target letter it would, would be under the assumption that Bob Mueller is sending that to them just for the fun of it. David Gergen, from a political standpoint, how, I mean, I, again, a lot of this will depend on actually what the charges are that, that have been filed. And again, to those who are just joining, we do not know what the charges are. That has not been, uh, that has not been announced, uh, nor are we, do we know or I think uh, saying who uh, are the, the who uh, charges have been filed against. But how does the White House play this? I mean, if it is, if it is not, uh, you know, uh, something to do directly with Russia, if it is a past uh, allegation of a crime, if it is a past charge for money laundering or some sort of uh, tax fraud or, or financial impropriety, what does the White House do from a political standpoint? Do they attack this? Well, I understand that, again, goes to the nature of the charges. If the charge comes back against a Manafort, for his personal, unrelated to the White House financial transactions in the past that somehow you know, violated some federal laws. I think the White House is then going to go on the attack. You know, it, they will treat this as a weak opening move by Mueller. You know, if the first thing he brings in is something that's unrelated to the president, unrelated to the collusion in Russia uh, charge, uh, you know, that makes it easy for them to say, we told you there wasn't much here, and look what he's come up with. You know, he's, he's had a massive investigation to come up with a mouse. On the other hand, if he comes in with something about uh, collusion, that's much more serious. And if you find something, frankly, about money laundering by the Trump team, it's and, and put aside Manafort, if it's, it's the Trump team has been in money laundering, you know, there have been a lot of rumors among people in New York and the investment community that at, that at the end of the day, that's what this is going to come down to. It's going to be much more about money laundering. Those two things should put a scare into the White House because that means he's building a case that could be very much go on land on their doorstep and indeed come inside the doors of the White House. Michael. So I think in that situation, I would assume they will try to discredit Mueller in a variety of ways. They will find friends to do that. I would assume that they have had some kind of game plan to do that uh, if, if something serious comes down. Uh, okay. But they're going to treat it a different way. It's going to re require a much more imaginative uh, uh, communications plan, frankly. Well, Michael, let me ask you, if you are on Mueller's team or if you are Robert Mueller, and you are aware of that, uh, of, you know, I mean, there, there's the legal case you want to make, and then there's also obviously this politicized environment. How much do you, how much does that seep into things? How much does that, do you, do you take that into account? I don't think Mueller will take much of the politics of this into account. Bob is a pretty serious guy who faces 
facts as he sees them and then makes decisions about those facts. I think that if he has indicted somebody on a collateral matter, let's say hypothetically it's a, it's a Manafort for his personal business dealings with Ukraine and that's what he's indicting him on now. Well that sends a message to Flynn because Flynn is also alleged to have had financial deal dealings with Turkey. That sends messages to others that maybe Flynn and Manafort will talk about the Jared Kushner meeting or the president's um, efforts to obstruct the Justice Department uh, investigation of Flynn. So there are lots of ripple effects that these indictments have. But in Mueller's case, I think really all he's doing is looking at evidence, making determinations, bringing charges, and then the collateral consequences of those charges will be determined down the line. Um, everybody just uh, hold on. Uh, we are just uh, at the top uh, of the hour. This is CNN.